number one choice for Air Guard news. This is First Air Force Now. Hello, and welcome again to another edition of First Air Force Now. I'm your new host, Captain Sarah Reich. Men and women from the New Jersey Air National Guard responded to Hurricane Sandy and the devastation it brought. Tech Sergeant Matt Hecht filed this report. On Monday, October 29th, Hurricane Sandy made landfall at the Jersey Shore. Airmen from the 177th Fighter Wing, Atlantic City International Airport, and at the 108th Wing, McGuire Air Force Base, were standing by to help those in need when the call went out. Send in the Air National Guard. Within hours, Air National Guardsmen were setting up shelters, assisting local law enforcement, and performing search and recovery operations. You're dealing with people who lost everything, and this is what we do as the National Guard, but it's one of those things where you you hope you don't have to do this, although it's what we sign up to do and it's our job. We're stationed right here. We're dispatching most people to this area, Love Ladies. Um, we're sending them to some different areas out here as well, North Beach. North Beach and Love Ladies we're mostly in. Um, a lot of the areas are dangerous because they still have gas leaks or they're underwater. Um, we're having our personnel go door to door, knock on doors. They're marking doors with a red piece of tape. Um, once they've knocked on it, to verify that somebody's either there and they want to stay, we can't force them to leave, or they are there and they want to leave, and then we get the police to come pick them up. Um, we're also taking note of power and gas lines, um, inaccessible houses, anything that looks like it's been looted. We're basically just doing any type of reconnaissance on this whole area, anything we can access. Can do a Long Beach Island to help out after Hurricane Sandy, to help out with the uh, clearing of the houses to make sure there was nobody there, see if there's anyone stranded, uh, see if anyone need, uh, needs to be evacuated for any reason at all. You do feel a little uh, touched by this all. You know, you got to remember people have lost all their, uh, their personal belongings here, they lost their lives here, you know. Whole houses have been destroyed with all their personal belongings that they've worked hard for. You know, people are in shelters now and, you know, a lot of people are going to have to rebuild after this. You know, so you do feel for the people. You go beyond the call of duty, according to me, what you've done. Under extraordinary circumstances with this horrible storm, you've really done a tremendous job. And I salute you, really, very much so. For First Air Force Now, <laughs> this is Technical Sergeant Matt Hecht. Pearl Harbor Day took on special meaning for members of the 120th Fighter Wing stationed in Hawaii. The wing ended deployed operations flying the alert mission protecting the Hawaiian Islands. Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson brings us this story from Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. The historical significance of the December 7, 1941 Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was not lost upon the Montanans. The Guardsmen completed over 28 months of 24-hour alert at Detachment 1, ensuring their fighter aircraft were ready to immediately respond to airborne threats to the area. Their service now ends as the Hawaii Air National Guard resumes alert operations after completing their conversion to the F-22 Raptor. We came out here uh, to do the alert mission for the Hawaii Guard who was transitioning to a new airplane. The only reason we're standing down is that the F-22 squadron is uh, ready to go and we're part of helping them get ready to go. Um, so we've basically done, done our part, I guess. The Montana vigilantes generated impressive flying statistics during the time spent at the detachment. Montana F-15s logged 1,560 flight hours flown over the course of 929 sorties, resulting in a 100% success rate with no missed time standing alert. It was a mission that needed to be done, and Montana has always been that unit that if there's something that needs to be done, we'll do it. The folks came down here and they did it in true Montana style, professionalism from day one. It has just been an outstanding uh, accomplishment. The alert mission required detachment personnel to remain on site in a quick response mode of operation 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. From the moment we took over the mission, we have never come down off status. So we have fulfilled every mission requirement asked of us here and overall big picture, I, I couldn't be happier. It's just an outstanding job and it's a, a real tribute to the men and women of the uh, Montana Air National Guard. At Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, this is Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reporting for First Air Force Now. With their alert requirement completed, members of Detachment 1 redeployed the aircraft and personnel back to Montana. Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson is back with the story. 
The 120th Fighter Wing members arrived at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam with six pallets of supplies and equipment, but accumulated a total of 16 pieces of rolling stock and 20 pallets of equipment and supplies to return to the mainland. We're going to utilize a fair amount of the workforce uh, that we've got here, but the reality is it's going to be those 11 people that have been here for the whole time. Along the shore of it, there's going to be about 14 of us here that are going to be packing and cracking and getting things out of town. Certified load planner Senior Master Sergeant Don Paul Sharon was a key player in the redeployment effort. She coordinated building the pallets of supplies and equipment that were loaded onto the C-5 and C-17 aircraft for transporting across the Pacific Ocean. Some equipment had been pre-positioned, but the packing couldn't be done until all F-15 fighter aircraft had left the island bound for Montana to ensure that parts and supplies were ready and available if needed. We figure from the time we can start building pallets to the time we send it over for its joint inspection, the JI, over that about three days. And we're going to build 36 increments in three days. It is just like a puzzle. You build it like a pyramid. You start at the outside and you build it up until you get to the very top. The goal was to have most of the Montana Guardsmen home by December 20th. You know, we knew our time was coming. We'd have to go. And, and we've all been away from home for a long time. And, and uh, you know, it, it, all good things must come to an end. But at the same time, it works out just about right that we're all going to get home just before Christmas. Should should make the holidays uh, real nice. Uh, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, are going to miss uh, you know, what we did here, especially when we get back to Montana and have to put that park on. <laughs> At Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, this is Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reporting for First Air Force Now. Members of the 146th ASOS returned home from a year-long deployment to Afghanistan. A1C Dustin Wheeler tells us how friends and family welcome these heroes home to Oklahoma. Airmen with the 146th Air Support Operations Squadron at Will Rogers Air National Guard Base were honored for their heroic efforts overseas during an official welcome home and facility ribbon cutting ceremony. I think these guys personified the comments that General Wyatt made way back in March of 2011 at the farewell ceremony when he told the brigade that uh, this small team of Air Force Battlefield Airmen has got your back and that they bring the entire deployed arsenal of the United States Air Force to the battlefield for you. You know, it's, it's never a bad day when we welcome our heroes home. And uh, I, I will tell you that, that I, I don't know of a day I was more proud uh, than the day they said the 146 was going to accompany the 45th Infantry Brigade Combat Team to uh, Afghanistan together. You know, we talk about service members, we talk about airmen, Marines, uh, and a lot of different things, but let me tell you, uh, I don't know... Your guys are much more than airmen. We consider you warriors, we consider you brothers, and we look forward to the opportunities to work together in the future. As we welcome you home today, let me just say that as you see a small unit behind you, uh, they brought that force in small clusters, and for that reason, some of them even stayed a little longer than was expected. They came back in ones and twos and not as a full unit sometimes that we always see and get to appreciate and enjoy. And so it was important for us today to also combine this as a welcome home ceremony. One that they could say as a unit and as a deployed group uh, that they had. And uh, so it's with a great debt of gratitude that we say welcome home and job well done. Reporting for First Air Force Now, I'm Dustin Wheeler from the 137th Air Refueling Wing. new home, a new mission. The Happy Hooligans are the new team in town. A team of warriors, trained, tested, and equipped. There's a new team in town. You could be one of them. Join the North Dakota Air Guard, the new team in town. Alexis Maxfield, Crew Chief. Charlie Post, Services. Lynn McKinney, Weapons Loader. William Hafford, Security Force. 
Ron Goodall, Human Resources. James Cornett, fighter pilot. Once a soldier. A soldier for life. Adjusting the radio. Two seconds. A sip of soda. Five and a half seconds. Checking a text. Six seconds. A few seconds of distraction can change a life. Stay alert. Save a life. Dakota Air Guard security forces received their first training on the Taser electronic control device. These new weapons complement their force-on-force -force measures. Master Sergeant Eric Johnson reports. Taser, taser, taser! Taser, taser, taser! Taser, taser, taser! taser, taser, taser. Electronic control device, or ECD training, is a yearly requirement for the security forces. It consists of a practical component, class poly, classroom uh, instruction. And what is it shoot out right there? On the wall? It's a laser. Okay. A written test. Taser. And voluntary taser. exposure. Taser. It, uh, it's important for them to see the, uh, the effects of it on someone firsthand as opposed to uh, the first time that you experience it is the first time you deploy it against someone out in a real world environment where you're trying to affect an arrest or uh, to protect yourself or someone else. So yeah, it gives a little bit more credibility to that taser, person that they taser, know taser. Um, what they're feeling. It wasn't what I expected. I don't think anyone really knows until you actually have it done. Whoa! <laughs> oh, that hurt really bad. The option of having a taser available is a great option. Obviously, we have uh, our defensive tactics <laughs> training, uh, baton training as well as our firearms training. Uh, however, this is just another tool in our arsenal uh, to help us deal with uh, less lethal force options. This volunteer is reporting from Fargo, North Dakota. I'm Master Sergeant. Taser, taser, taser. I'm Master Sergeant Eric Johnson reporting for First Air Force now. Forward surgical teams are a mix of Army, Navy, and Air Force personnel, including active duty, guard, and reserve. Sergeant Katie Gray brings us the Logman Trauma Center story. The forward surgical team at Forward Operating Base Logman is a varied medical team of Army, Navy, and Air Force personnel. They come from the active duty, National Guard, and reserves, and are trained to deal with medical emergencies and provide initial care to ISAF forces. They also have the capabilities to deal with non-traumatic patients, such as one Afghan soldier suffering from an old IED wound. There's about 25, 26 of us here with this unit together. When you first come in, you have all these different people uh, from different locations that are just kind of thrown together as a team. So challenges as far as uh, getting to know one another and getting to work with one another, yeah, that's, that's kind of a rough ride in the beginning. But sooner or later, everybody's on one accord and you're just flowing right through the whatever it is that you have coming in. You get to work with a lot of, you know, professional people who are going to do their job very well. Uh, the experience here is great. I think you'll never ever get to experience this kind of setting, you know, with the trauma that we do receive from the war. Uh, and it's nothing like, nothing like the States. And I've been to the trauma centers down in LA and stuff like that. And it's pretty good training down there too, but up here it's, you'll never experience it. So me, I work in OBGYN back in the States. Um, and it's a little bit different because there's no, no trauma aspect to it. And here that's all you see pretty much. Uh, I definitely think it's something that uh, people should definitely have an opportunity to see hands-on, up close and personal what we do in, a, in an environment like this. So. Honestly, I just joined just to do, I was going to do my, four, my first four years and then uh, I was going to get out and then, you know, do the civilian stuff, but um, I've actually enjoyed it and I'm learning a lot and it's a, you know, a great experience for me. Mixed martial arts are becoming very popular in the military's culture. 
Airman First Class Stephen Ellis tells us how one staff sergeant pursues this hobby off-duty. Steve Burks has been fighting for four years. He spent two months preparing for his 12th match. Last week you don't want to get hurt, get, uh, get put out of fight for the last week doing all this training. And then at our, at our jail Capital, really like being the guy that's on weight, uh, making weight, uh, no problems with us having all our blood work and everything we need to fight that way. There's no uh, stumbles when, you get ready, when you're trying to fight, when you got a lot of other stuff to concentrate on. Sergeant Burks, also known as Mr. Fantastic, for his outstanding arm span and reach, has won all of his MMA matches. He says his coaches help him the most, but his mentality is also important. You want to relax and just think. That's, that's the main thing. As soon as you panic, you're giving up position, you, you're getting submitted and all that stuff. So as long as you relax and just don't freak out and don't panic, you'll be able to get out of position. The match went to the full three rounds. After 15 minutes of kicking, punching, and grappling, the judges couldn't decide on a clear winner, resulting in Steve's first ever draw. Reporting from Hurlbert Field, I'm Airman First Class Stephen Ellis. In Peoria, Illinois, members of the 182nd Airlift Wing are settling into their new state-of-the-art operations building. Technical Sergeant Chip Dice has the story. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's dedicate this new building. Go ahead and cut. On September 8, 2012, the 182nd Airlift Wing in Peoria, Illinois, hosted a ribbon-cutting ceremony for its new operations building. The brand new $9 million plus facility will give the pilots, navigators, life support, and other operations personnel the much needed facilities and space to do the mission. You know, the mission of the 182nd is to provide air land, air drop, command and control, communications, logistics, and support services for the nation, state, and community. And this building will help us do that more efficiently. The new building measures in at over 27,000 square feet and directly incorporates energy and environmental cost-saving measures. This state-of-the-art facility has a geothermal well ventilation system, solar reflective roof, special window shade fixtures, motion sensor lighting, water conserving faucets, and much more, all the while solving the space allocation problems of the past. This is just an amazing facility, and I can't tell you enough just how important this Air Force installation here, this Air National Guard installation is, to the state of Illinois and our ability to conduct operations overseas, as well as our ability to support homeland security and homeland defense type operations. And this multi-million dollar investment in the 182nd Airlift Wing is also an investment for the surrounding community. The benefits of the 182nd extend beyond the jobs and federal dollars that come into the Peoria area. The 182nd employs roughly 1,200 people in this region. Its wing brings in millions of dollars each year to the Tri-County area. And as a community, we have collectively worked together to ensure those in Central Illinois are provided with the equipment, the support and care you and your families need to do your job well. All this will give us a continued capability to keep the squadron the best in the Air Guard and the best in the Air Force. Reporting for First Air Force Now, I'm Technical Sergeant Chip Dice at the 182nd Airlift Wing. Guardian of Freedom and Justice. My, my nation's sword and shield. It's Sentry and Avenger. I'm a wingman and a leader. I will never leave an airman behind. I will never falter and I will not fail. I, I am, am an, an American, American airman. airman. 
I am fit to fight. Are you? Once a soldier. A soldier for life. the Montana Air National Guard, people just like you. People like Jackie Fogarty, daughter and part-time medical administrator, Ed McLean, prior service Marine Corps, Great Falls police officer, and part-time security forces member, Brian Hagee, train engineer and part-time heavy equipment operator. Extraordinary people doing extraordinary jobs. Come join your neighbors, friends, and families as members of the Montana Air National Guard. Call 800-874-7763 or find us on the web at mtairguard.com. Command of the 601st Air and Space Operations Center and the 101st Air and Space Operations Group changed hands in a combined ceremony held at Tyndall Air Force Base in late November. Captain Jared Scott reports. An age-old military tradition of passing of flags during the dual ceremony symbolized the change in leadership as Colonel John Ferry assumed command of the 101st Air and Space Operations Group from Colonel Thomas Cucci. The Adjutant General of Florida, Major General Emmett Titshaw Jr. presided over the ceremony. I'd just like to tell the uh, men and women of the 101st AOG that it was truly an honor to serve for you uh, as your commander. Though I'll use Colonel Spears' mantra, mission first, people always. The 101st AOG is the people always part. The 601st commander in, in my mind is doing the mission. 101st provides those resources so that the 601st commander can do that mission. And I, I can't tell you how proud I am of all of you that have supported your divisions and your senior enlisted to make it a successful organization. Prior to becoming the 101st AOG commander, Colonel Ferry served as the 601st AOC Strategy Division Chief, responsible for leading the planning efforts for the AOC. I'm beyond humbled to be given this opportunity to lead these men and women. I promise to take good care of them. To the men and women of the 101st, I look forward to the challenges that lie ahead. Together, we will continue to represent the finest the Air National Guard has to offer. I'm proud to say we're a guardsman, I'm proud to say we are a family, and I'm proud to say that we are the 101st. Colonel Cucci assumed command of the 601st AOC from Colonel Randy Spear in a ceremony presided over by Lieutenant General Sid Clark, 1st Air Force Commander. The hard part, as always with the commander, is all the administrative actions that are required you know, keeping the staff together, keeping that pack going, all the personnel actions. And indeed, I would tell you that being the commander is a lonely role sometimes. But String did a great job with all of that. To the men and women of the 601st AOC, what a joy it has been, what a humbling experience, uh, and at the same time, I'm very proud to have been your commander. Colonel Cucci, Colonel Ferry, I envy the position that you guys are assuming. I'm excited about the two individuals for the uh, group in the center here that, that will be taken over, you both are exactly the right people at exactly the right time to take the AOC to the next level. May God bless both of you and the AOC family. The ceremony not only marked a change in leadership at the AOC, but also a big change in Colonel Spears' life as he retired after 25 years of dedicated service to the United States Air Force. Reporting for First Air Force Now, I'm Captain Jared Scott. In Oklahoma City, Will Rogers Air Guard Base hosted several units during a multiple aircraft training program. Airman First Class Dustin Wheeler brings us the story. The 137th Air Refueling Wing hosts their first total force exercise known as MATOP. We're conducting an exercise today, multiple aircraft training opportunity program. And uh, it's important to know the reason for this uh, exercise is that it's the nature of air medical evacuation that when we deploy, we integrate guard, reserve, active duty into coalescent crews. So they come together in a deployed environment and work with various types of airframes. So what we've done here is brought together guard and reserve, given them an opportunity to integrate in a training environment and also made available the different airframes that we would encounter in a deployed environment. 
So by pulling everybody together, mixing crews, guard and reserve, and putting them on airframes they're not familiar with, we've given them the opportunity to enhance their capabilities in a deployed environment. So not only does this help us to perform better in a deployed environment, we also have our mission at home as guardsmen. So this certainly increases our capability of responding to hurricanes, tornadoes, any other events here at home to where we can be activated for. Because uh, we would go in those same environments and we might be uh, needed to work on different airframes than what we're used to working with. So this really increases our capability to perform our home station mission as well. This is the first time that uh, Will Rogers Air National Guard Base has hosted one of these. We're happy to do that and it's nice to have our brothers and sisters from the Air Force Reserves in active duty here with us, uh, training alongside of us for a total force. Uh, that's very important and I think that it just shows that the dedication of our citizen soldiers working alongside our active duty components uh, to provide not only a state capability but a federal capability uh, to support the De Department of Defense and our wounded airmen and soldiers. Reporting for First Air Force Now, I'm Dustin Wheeler from the 137th Air Refueling Wing. Recently, professional fighters from the UFC stopped by Joint Base Lewis-McCord to support the troops and show their appreciation. Sergeant Elwin Lovelace reports. Today there are no cages for these ultimate fighters as they come to JBLM to meet soldiers from the Wounded Warrior Battalion. The fighters took a break from training for their next big fight to hear the stories of the soldiers and share a few of their own. Uh, I fought 13 times before I made it on the Ultimate Fighter, and I didn't think I'd make it on because I didn't have the attitude. I grew up a modest, uh, basically a middle class uh, lifestyle. Many soldiers came out to meet and greet the fighters in appreciation of their support. It's good to, to be appreciated by, you know, uh, the civilian populace, but also their famous fighters. You know, they fight for a living, so do we, but we do a different kind of fighting. And they come out here and, and appreciate us, and it's, it warms my heart that, you know, somebody cares. One UFC fighter says what he does pales in comparison to what U.S. soldiers do on a daily basis. You know, what, we, what we do is, uh, you know, people think it's risky and, you know, uh, kind of high stakes. And after you hear their stories, I didn't want to tell my story. Uh, what we do is very small compared to what those warriors and uh, the troops do for, for the U.S. And um, it, it, it's intense. It was, it was crazy to hear their stories. The fighter stayed until the last autograph was signed and the last picture was taken. Army Staff Sergeant Elwin Lovelace, Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington. I'm Captain Sarah Reich, and that wraps up another edition of First Air Force Now. To help us tell your story, contact the First Air Force News Director. And to all the men and women who are making sacrifices at home and abroad, thanks. We'll see you again soon with another edition of First Air Force Now.